No one will be that eternal priestly bride, but she who has made herself ready. For the battle is raging, the devil is raging, I don't want to be sleeping while the battle is Welcome back to the Brenda Price Ministries podcast. Today we are on the third part of a series of lessons titled The Eternal Unveiling. Evangelist Brenda Price has a book available that corresponds with these lessons of the same name, and it'll take you even deeper into this study. You can find it on our store page at brendapriceministries.weebly.com. That's Brenda Price Ministries. Dot w-e-e-b-l-y dot com. If you have been enjoying these podcasts, you can subscribe to them at the website as well. Now let's listen in as Evangelist Brenda Price takes us even deeper into the study of the eternal unveiling. Well, here we are again. Good to be back with you for part three of the eternal unveiling. Well, we left off last time talking about the fact that he has our own book in heaven that is written with the story of how he romanced us and how we romanced him and how it played out. Oh, I tell you, I know that my name is written there. (laughs) I know the story of me and my Jesus is written there. I, I know its beginnings. I know how it felt, but I don't know how he felt about all of it. I don't know what he experienced every time I surrendered part of myself to his kingdom. But I do teach Song of Solomon, and in that, there's a uh, revelation of how the bridegroom was so overtaken by just looking at the bride. And every time, friends, that we surrender to the will of God, we do his will instead of ours. You see, when Jesus, let me change a little bit here and go into this. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, and he said to to Peter, James, and John, watch and pray. He wasn't just saying, watch and look out what's going on around you here and pray, but he was wanting to demonstrate to them what a second understanding of prayer was from the first understanding he gave them when he said, they said to him, rather, teach us to pray. And he gave them a certain format. But now he's saying, do you really want to see what it's like when I pray to the Father? Come on, Peter. Come on, James and John. Watch and pray and do likewise. Because in the garden, Jesus going through in his his heart, in his mind, all the things that were before him and all the things that would happen. And as he was in uh, dire straits, because I believe that while he was in the garden, uh, sweating, as it were, great drops of blood that his very life was being sapped out of him even at that time but during that time of duress he would have turned to the disciples so that they could hear him say nevertheless not my will but thine be done that is the lesson Jesus wanted to teach them and so when we as the ones contending to be the bride of Jesus, we turn to him and when he says, let that go and we let it go and surrender it and trust him, he's overwhelmed with our love. When we stand before those who jeer and make fun of the bridegroom within us and Christianity in general or the dynamics of your personal intimacy with Christ, 
And we say, Lord, I choose to walk this path and to love you above all earthly loves. He's overwhelmed. You know, I find that the closer I get to Jesus, the less fascination I have with anything else on this earth. Watching TV has no fascination whatsoever for me. Uh, Just doing the things that ordinary people do. I do it sometimes. I'll go with my family out to eat, which I enjoy, of course. And I spend time talking with them, which I enjoy. But doing the games and the parties and none of that holds fascination or draws me at all. I've been with my bridegroom. And that is what my heart yearns for. And so, in that great library in heaven, there's a book written of how he won you and how you won him. Each surrender that you gave, each time you turned away from the world and embraced holiness, each time that you decided not to be angry and you decided to walk in peace. Every time you allowed someone to make fun of you and you prayed for your enemy. All those surrenders, they became part of your story. They became part of his story. So, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them when he was on the cross, he was also demonstrating something so important. That even if someone is putting you to death, that person you have to love enough to say, Father, forgive them. So he watches every quickening of the heart, doesn't he? Every motive of the heart. Well, to think that Brenda Price's name is interwoven with Jesus in his history is overcoming to me. But my name is written in the book of Revelations. And I know yours is too. I know that God has a book written that contains the love story of every overcomer throughout history. Won't that be interesting, friends? Won't that be fun in eternity to come to be able to look and read all the stories of not only the well-known people, but the little nobodies who spent time with the Lord and that was their thrill and joy in their lives? I can't wait to hear the testimonies. It kind of starts, this whole thing starts with us, him wooing us, and it continues with the inner struggle that we go through to get back to where he's wooing us and pay attention to us. And then it kind of explodes into color when the bride finally, and without reservation, just flings herself into full abandonment and says, yes, yes, Jesus, whatever you ask, whatever you request, no matter what the price, I say yes. This comes when the embrace of Jesus says back to her, I say yes to you. You are mine. I accept your vow and I will take you through. Yep, this is our story and this is the moment that each, that in each and every life God's glory is manifest through us on earth. It's the knowledge of a love sick bridegroom coupled with the knowledge that the same love That he gives us is also a jealous love that will not allow anything else to take its place. This knowledge will help us to fully overcome. And there is now pressure being applied to the cloud of the latter rain and its outpouring. And when we line it up with the cry of the spirit and the cry of the bride, that rain, that revival That move of God's presence on earth will be released as we apply the pressure in continual obedience and intimacy. Well, I want to talk a moment about the third feast. If you read uh, some of my other books, uh, there are three great feasts that the Jews celebrate. The third being the Feast of Tabernacles. The first feast, the Tabernacle, uh, or excuse me, the first feast of um, Passover was finished and completed when Jesus uh, was crucified and rose again. And Pentecost, of course, we know when that was fulfilled. And all these were the fullness of times. There are fullnesses of time that the Bible relates. The fullness of time, his spirit was poured out in the 
fullness of time, the Son of God was um, born. But this third fullness of time is just now beginning to take place. And its fulfillment comes in the third feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. I don't have time to get into all of that. There's a lot of theological understanding in this as you break down the Feast of Tabernacles. But I'm going to try to hit it in a small way today because God created or began time in order to fulfill a purpose or a destiny. For something to be completed, it has to begin. So the purpose for this created order is greater than the seed, as I said in the last podcast, that produced it. The beginning of the earth, the beginning of Adam, and all the things that's happened since. This was the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacle in seed form. He created all mankind in spirit and in form, uh, and then he created the whole universe to accommodate and house this cherished possession. And when I received that revelation, it was, it was something, um, you know, man was not the afterthought. Man was the forethought. In other words, God said, I'm going to create man. He's going to have a free will. He will be my family. His children will be my children. My desire will be to fulfill them. And in doing so, they will fulfill me. And he says, but I have to create something for them to live on. So he created all the things that are around us to fascinate us, to cause enjoyment. And... um, But it was all for the created man and woman. It was all for them. The earth, my friend, was built for us. The food, everything on this planet was built for us. Well, you know, the environmentalists say it's the other way around. There was a created earth, or not a created, but in their uh, understanding, they think it just came to be, and that we're the intruders. Oh, no. Mm -mm. We are here because God created this earth for us. We were not the afterthought. We were the forethought of everything that actually preceded the formation of man on the earth. And even before it all began, God knew man would need a savior. So he asked his son, son, this is my plan. And the son being one with the father was willing to say yes. And that yes of the father and the son to be in union with what was coming is what he's trying to create in the bride that we will be one with his will to finish and accomplish what he began when he said let there be well sometime later as we all know Jesus came to earth the angels sang the shepherds and the wise men came to worship But this, too, was just at the beginning of God's purpose. Even as God created the heavens and the earth, it would pale in comparison with the fulfillment of why it was created. Well, we know that this seed cannot compare in size or grandeur to the full-grown tree that it created. And trying to understand the mind of God is something akin to looking at some new invention for the first time. Looking at this new uh, technology or this new invention may look awesome and the process of, it, of its creativity may be a marvel, but what was it designed to do? We can watch the gears move. We can see the energy it creates. We can hear the sound of the gears in motion, or we can even see it processing something. But why was it created? What is the end result of all that was carefully built and framed. There is more to it than just motion and energy and mechanical parts. Likewise, we might ask God, why did you create heaven, earth, light, dark, land, sea? Why was man put here and generations come and go? Was the moment of creation, as tremendous as it was, the great moment that God desired while everything went downhill from there? 
And now God must salvage what is left of his design. Then we triumphantly pass into eternal life and leave the dark remains of a fallen world. No, oh, that's anticlimactic to say the least. I can give an explanation that God's great plan is only played out when the world becomes comes into the millennial reign, but I believe that this is the uh, outcome. The millennial reign is the outcome of what comes, precedes it, and comes before it. I, I can't aptly describe what he's doing in this last hour. I can only tell you that there is nothing that you can look at or nothing ever created And as the Bible says, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for him. He has prepared something in this hour that is so dynamic in its intention and in its uh, created order that we cannot even begin to describe it. Those of us who have seen portions of it, much less be able to, um, to put it into this small podcast. But I'm going to try to do the best I can to uh, give you some understanding. But I believe that the millennial reign is only that which was produced by his final eternal unveiling, which is a bride that made herself ready and the fiery burning ones that will come forth in this hour. The plan that both John and Daniel were told to seal into the time of the end is the mystery that is soon to be completely unveiled and is being unveiled. And even now, as you're listening, many of you are getting the revelation. You know, I began this book, if you get a chance to read and purchase it uh, on our uh, website, that in the month of February and March of 2009, when I went through the grueling trial, the sleep deprivation, that lasted about four weeks. This was not worry or stress, but a time of testing and a time of birthing. And all that I've been talking about came from that revelation in the midst of this trial. First, he let me know that I was being taught how to suffer because that is part of what's going to happen in this day. And many other countries and nations are going through it right now. There is more martyrs upon the earth now in this last uh, 30, 40 years than all the years put together. And I know that's an astronomical figure of those who have been martyred for Jesus Christ. But believe it or not, this time period that we've moved into has produced more uh, victims, as the world would look at it, but more bright, shining ones who have decided to follow Jesus all the way to the death. So he let me know that I was being taught how to suffer so I could teach others how to go through these times. Second, I was learning how to be refined and processed. And thirdly, he would give me the full understanding of this last page of history that would be the greatest hour of the true church and bride of Jesus. And he said, I am positioning your heart to climb over every obstacle until your longing heart reaches my full embrace. He wants to accelerate this longing until we bypass every natural desire that gets in the way, even food, sleep, bodily necessities must cease to control us. He must break the cry of the body until the spirit is no longer captive to the body. He frankly asked me, what is more important to you? Your sleep, your food, your warmth, your earthly companions, your natural securities, or me? I said this in our first podcast, but when your body no longer controls you, he said, I can. Amen. This podcast has been a production of Brenda Price Ministries. Evangelist Brenda Price has more materials available on this subject, including her most recent book titled, the eternal unveiling. It can be found at our website along with other resources we have made available. The website can be found at brendapriceministries.weebly.com.